Hey everybody, welcome to Least Square Problems with me. Um, big idea for today. You may have already had experience doing this, like maybe you've used Excel for a chemistry or a physics class, and you get some data, and then you have to find an equation that best represents this data. Um, how does that work? Can we do it with linear algebra? Yes. Yes, we can, and we're going to work up to that by the end of today. You won't even need Excel anymore. It's going to be super cool. Okay. But first, what I want you guys to do is I want you to recall the distance from a vector to a subspace and how we can find that. So I'm just going to call these guys x1 and x2 over here. And then remember, we can use Gram-Schmidt because... Um, he makes everything orthogonal. So quick check before we even get going. Since we know we're going for Gram-Schmidt, are the basis vectors already orthogonal? Yes, they are. So that's cool. We, we're going to get to use those guys. So we only really need to do Gram-Schmidt for B. So remember, we have B. We have B parallel. And B parallel is the closest vector in V to B. And so this distance right here, that's the distance between our vector and our subspace. And that's going to be B minus B parallel, which is the same thing as B perpendicular. Okay, um, and we can find that, again, using Gram-Schmidt. So we say V1 is just going to be X1, and then we say V2 can just be X2 because we already know that they're orthogonal, and then V3, we're going to take the part of B that is perpendicular to both V1 and V2. So we have to subtract off two components, B1, oh, B <laughs> dot V1, there we go, V1 dot V1, V1. And then second component, V2, there we go. Okay, so if we do all all of our dot products, we end up with, um, what is it? I think it's 1 half V1 minus V2. And then I'm going to draw your attention just to like, if we put parentheses around this, we can say that this part is B parallel. Just another recall. Please remember that for me. And then if we plug in all these numbers, we end up with negative 5 halves, 1 negative a half, like that. And then the distance between um, our vector and our subspace, I already said that's going to be B perp, which B perp is just what's left over of B after subtracting off that stuff, which means it's B3. And then, or just in case you forgot what that is too, that's just this. So if we do that dot product, we end up with 15 over 2, and then that square root does all of it like that. Okay, so that's hopefully a quick crash course. And then now I'm going to do something that's like really important. I'm going to have you guys recall that um, B having distance between B and our subspace means that B does not live in V. What does live in V is B parallel, which means if we were to try 
and use the uh, basis vectors of V to build a matrix. So like, it looks like this. So built the matrix, and if we try and do it for this matrix equation, we know this has no solution because B being a solution is the same thing as being a linear combination of those vectors, which it is not because we had a perpendicular component. He doesn't, he doesn't live in the space of V. But what will have a solution is this equation. And we're going to use that to our advantage. So when we can... Definition. The least square solution to AX equals B, so assuming... This doesn't mean that it... Um, we're kind of assuming that it doesn't have a solution. Like AX equals B, maybe it doesn't have a solution. So we're looking for an alternative path. And just like I said, um, we're looking for some, something that already lives in this column space of A. So the way that this is phrased here, I don't like the way this is phrased. I think it's confusing to think about. But this is how the book says it. So this is how we're saying it. Is we're taking a vector such that this distance is less than all other distances, aka if we were to like look at B and be like, where is it closest to? It's closest to this X right here, X hat times A. And then like, we'll say um, over here is A times some other one, x1 or something. Like obviously this distance directly downwards is going to be closer than that distance where you have to like go off to the side a little bit. Um, so if x hat is minimizing the distance between b and the column space of a, that means a times x hat is b parallel. That's why we started off with our recall real quick. So rephrase, much less confusing way to think about this in my opinion. So rephrase of our definition is the least squares, go away, solution to AX equals B solves a x hat equals b parallel, right? Because b parallel is going, the distance between b and b parallel is going to be less than everything else. Okay. Um, so, right now, we know how to go about this. We would have to like go through B, we would have to find its projection, and then we'd have to set up a new system of equations and then solve that for X. And it's a lot of back and forth and it's very tedious. And even if you put it into a computer, it's not the most efficient way to go about it. So let's try and be clever. Let's think about what this is implying. So let's see, I'm gonna draw this for the third time. Apparently I really like this drawing. So we have B, we have B parallel. B parallel is going to be A times X hat, because that, that's the only thing that we can solve. It is the closest thing that we can get. And then remember, that means B perp is over here because he's equal to b minus b parallel, right? He's this vector that would go right there and connect the two of them. Okay, 
So what just from this drawing, I guess I should label this, this would be the column space of A. So these are all the vectors in A, all the columns in A. They make up this subspace. B is not in that subspace, so it's not doesn't have a solution, but B parallel is. And so we are solving this guy. Let's get creative. Let's see if we can hack this into something that's easier to deal with. Let's start with B perpendicular. What is he perpendicular to? He is perpendicular to the column space of A. That means any vector in the column space of A dotted with B perpendicular is going to be zero. Specifically, all of the columns of A. So some random column dotted with B perp has to be equal to zero. And then remember that we can rewrite this using a transpose like that. But wait, a transpose looks like this. like that. And so if we come through and we dot each of these guys by like B perp like that, we could get an entire like kind of system going. So let's do that. So A transpose times B perp is going to end up being the zero vector like that. All right. So we're Again, we're trying to look for an easy way to express a uh, x hat, preferably not using b perp and b parallel and all that terrible stuff. So let's su try and substitute out this b perp. Well, we know b perp is b minus b parallel. So we kind of traded out one evil for another. Let's replace that b parallel. I said b parallel is x x hat or a x hat, ugh. There we go. Okay, so then if we distribute and rearrange just a little bit, now we have this. All right, so if x hat is the least square solution, x hat solves this equation. And that's nice because now we don't have to worry about projections. We just take a transpose. Transposes are easy. In fact, so easy, so useful. Here it is as a theorem. The least square solution of ax equals b also satisfies this equation that we did right here. And the proof for that is, see previous page. QED, we're done, okay. So that's nice. Now we have x hat, and now we just have to solve this instead of going through all of our projection stuff. But you know what would be even more helpful? is if we didn't have to do like Gaussian elimination and stuff to like reduce, like ATA is now its own matrix and like, if we didn't have to like Gaussian, do a Gaussian elimination, like that would be much more convenient for us. It would be so nice if we actually could like take this to the world of IMT, um, which, you know what? If we are there, we know how to solve that. Remember, um, if we're in the land of IMT, then we have like invertible matrices. So we could just do something like, oh, let's multiply both sides by its inverse like this. Yes, remember, side matters. And so we would keep it on the left. that. 
mean, that would be like super easy if we were living in this world. So easy. Here's part of 6.14. Like I thought it was the only part that was like really important for us. Um, if the matrix AT times A is invertible, which it could be because remember uh, dimension analysis real fast. If this is like an M by N, then AT would be N by M. So it would indeed end up being a square. So if it's invertible, then the least square solution to AX equals B would be given by this very handy formula, which again, it's like not gonna be super easy to compute that by hand, but it does make things much faster for computers. And it also makes it very easy to put into a computer. Okay, so with that in mind, let's try and move forward. Let's see what we can do with this. So we want to find the least square solution to the inconsistent equation, ax equals b, where a is this and b is that. Should look familiar, like from page one. Okay. So we know that x hat is equal to a transpose a inverse of all of that a t b. What we are not going to do is say, I know properties of inverses. I can like do a switcheroo like this. That is not what we're going to do. Why? A is not square. We can't do that. We may be able to find the inverse of A transpose times A, but we cannot necessarily find the inverse of just A. If we could find the inverse of just A, then like we, this wouldn't be an inconsistent equation to start with and we wouldn't really care about this anyway. Okay, so word of caution, do not distribute that inverse, it's not gonna work. So as long as this is invertible, we can do this. And um, I'm not so interested in the theory as letting you guys like actually see this work. Um, and so all the examples I'm gonna give you, yes, it will be invertible. I'm interested in using it, not so much as being careful with, what does this imply? I wanna see things work. I'm an applied mathematician. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna go over to Mathematica, and then if we were to evaluate this just real fast, all I did was I put my A and B matrices in there um, just to make sure that I'm doing it correctly. And yes, yes I am. Here we go. So we're gonna say A hat will be equal to, and then we have to take the transpose of a times a, and then we need the inverse of all of that. There we go. And then that's times transpose of a times b. And there we go. And I'm gonna matrix form it. And look at that. So this is A, this is B, and then the third output is our X hat. So easy. Okay. All right. So that's really cool. We were able to find some version of a solution for AX equals B, even though B didn't actually belong. Um, it wasn't actually solvable. But now the question becomes like, how good is this solution though? Like if it's a bad solution, like that's not helpful. <laughs> You're like, okay. Well, um, the same, so this is the question. How good is the solution? 
Well, that's, we could rephrase this to be like, um, what is the distance between a x hat and a x oops normal normal x <clears throat> so i'm not asking what the distance is between um x hat and normal x because normal x doesn't exist if it existed we wouldn't have to do all this hoop jumping so what i can ask is what's the difference between a x hat and a x because a x would have been the solution or would have been the expected outcome of a times x. That's what we wanted to happen. But we couldn't do that. We could only do this. This is b parallel. Remember that. So we can ask how far is b from b parallel? Because if it's like really close, if it's like, if this is our plane and we get like a vector that's like pretty much like right there and there's only like a little bit of space between it and the subspace like that's a pretty good approximation we almost got what we expected to get so then here we go least squares error is the distance between the given vector b and the vector we use to get the solution b parallel so you just take the distance between b and a times x hat, which is just b parallel. Which we actually already did, if you remember our recall. That was, let's see, so error would be b minus a x hat, which is really just the b minus b parallel, which is really just the magnitude of b perp, which we found during the recall at the very beginning. Okay, so we've gotten closer, like that's kind of an interesting number. Obviously the smaller it is, the better. Um, we wanna minimize our error. But that still doesn't really tell us like how good our solution is. What I mean by that is if you have, here you go, should have like a counter. How many times do I draw this picture today? If we have this going on, then we'll say that this is our axes. And then maybe like this is, 0 0.001 you're like oh that's a tiny number that's like really good right well without changing the drawing without changing the angle between the vector and the subspaces i could have labeled it like that and so now the number is like really really big now the distance got bigger but i didn't do anything other than change the scale and our error shouldn't depend on how our you know, axes are scaled, basically. So what should it depend on? Well, what it needs to be depend on, it needs to be relative, like this distance here, if this is small, we want compa yeah. compared to this distance. That's what we're going to compare it to. That's going to let us kind of like skirt around this potential scaling problem where it might look big, but it's not actually a big problem. Okay, or it might look small, but it's actually a big problem. Okay. Um, so that brings us to our next definition. Um, we don't even, this isn't in your book. Um, this is just a normal, like, once you get into computer science sort of a thing. Um, or any numerical stuff. So the relative error, so, is given by normal error over the length of the vector that you 
started with. So for example that we already had again, we would have our error, and I meant to put a little relative down there like that, is equal to b minus b parallel all over regular b. Everybody gets a hat. And then that's going to be root 15 over 2. And then what was the magnitude of b? Um, something like, why am I doing this by hand? I had Mathematica up earlier. <laughs> I did this for a reason. Don't do this by hand. Use Mathematica. This is all about numerical stuff. Okay, here it is. So then that was example one. And then example two. Ah, yes. So you just take norm. That is the command for finding the distance. And then b minus a dot x hat. That was example two, which we had already computed at the very beginning. So we didn't need to recompute that. But here we go. Here's um, the one that we're doing right now. So the relative error would be the norm of b minus a times x hat all over the norm of b. And then I'm using this n right here because if you don't, it ends up spitting out an exact answer, which is great a lot of the time. But right now, I want a decimal. Um, let's see. Evaluate cell, please. Oh, man. That is not what it was supposed to do. I think I have to reevaluate stuff. Let's see, evaluate cell. Evaluate cell. What has happened to my life? I'm going to pause. Okay, I figured it out. Um, so matrix form, Mathematica doesn't know how to deal with it when it looks like matrix form. You have to leave it Mathematica interpretable, which looks like that. So now if I come through and I do that, see, it's going to keep it very exact. It's 15 over 2. And then when we evaluate this guy, there we go. There's the decimal that I wanted. Okay, take this back to the lecture. Did you, did you say, forget you. I have a computer to do this for me because I'm important. And then we'll just keep two decimal places. Okay, what does this mean? Okay, for interpretation, if B was in the column space of A, then B would equal B parallel. So then B minus B parallel would be zero. And so our relative error would be zero. You're like, well, big deal. That's what we would have gotten before we were talking about relative error. Okay, relative error comes in here. If B is perpendicular to the column space of A, so it's like, there is no parallel component. It's standing straight up. He can't, you can't really express him using the column space of A at all because he has nothing to do with it. So that would be the worst case scenario, right? Then B would equal B perpendicular. So B parallel would be the zero vector. It has no um, no part of B is in the column space of A. B parallel is zero. And then that means that our relative error would be just the magnitude of B minus the zero vector over the magnitude of B. And that is one. So this is kind of like percentages. Like how bad is our error? If it's zero percent bad, that's great. If it's 100% bad, well, that's bad. So to interpret this, this is, we'll say, 73% bad. 
bad. So it wasn't really a good um, problem to try and work. It means that B was standing more upright than compared to the plane than like laying down close to the plane. Okay. I promised that we were going to um, interpret data you, and make equations of lines. So that's what we're going to go to next. So we may not have gotten a great answer, but we got the only answer possible here. So these are called best fit problems. So example four, we're just going to jump, jump right in. Suppose we have measured three data points. We've got those guys. And we would like to find the equation on the line that best fits this data. So what this looks like, finally going to draw something different, is we've got something that kind of looks like this. Like this is our data. And if we wanted a line to come through here, it would probably be something like that. General equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. Um, what is that line though? How do we figure that out? So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a system of equations by plugging in our numbers into this equation. So if we plug them in, that means y would be 6, and then we don't know what m is, but we know x was 0 plus b. And then if we do point 2, y was 0, but x was 1, and then we have 0, m times 2 plus b. That would be point 3. So this is a system of linear equations where m and b are our variables. We have three equations. We have two unknowns, so we should hopefully be able to get something out. But oh wait. I can tell you right now, no solution. Why? Because just look at this picture. <laughs> You're not going to find a line that fits all three data points. It's not going to happen. Oh no, come back. Here we go. So then what are we going to do? We're going to try and do, um, we're going to solve this system right here. We're going to do, um, <laughs> So what would A be in this case? It would be 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1. And then our x vector would be M and B is equal to 6, 0, 0. So we would try and um, find a least square solution to this. And here, let's get into the Mathematica. Um, I'm going to back up for a second to show you how I want you to do this for like worksheets. So like example four, I'm going to hand you a problem. I'm going to say, here's some data, do all these things. And I want you to remember that you can like type in Mathematica. So like if you hit, I don't know, alt five, you can say like part A. And then, what's alt 6? If I do like the system of equations. I can type the system of equations into Mathematica, um, not necessarily like in a helpful way, <laughs> but you can put your answer into Mathematica so that you're not trying to submit a handwritten document and a Mathematica document, and that's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. So my system of equations would have looked like um, so 0, m plus b equals 6. And then 0, 1, m plus, or I guess you could just do m. There you go. m plus b equals 0, and then m plus Oh, it's 2m now. 2m plus b equals 0. So there you go. I have written my system of equations um, in Mathematica. I used Alt 7. And if, if I do Alt 8, that's a, or Alt 9. Alt 9 is the 
code cell, and so now M's and B's look different. Everything looks different, really. There we go. That's just a normal text. And then what do we want to do? We want to solve an augmented matrix. So if I were to ask you, write down the augmented matrix equation, or not the augmented matrix equation, <laughs> write down the matrix equation. Um, no, I, I did not ask that. From here, I think I asked you just to find the least squares solution. So like, alt four, six, um, solve or no, find the least squares solution. So now we get into coding. So I would want to define A to be, let's see, it had two rows, or no, three col two columns, three rows. So that's going to be zero comma one, one comma one, two comma one, and then B is going to be equal to six zero. Zero. And then I'm going to check the matrix form just to be sure. Okay. So those are good. So then what I'm looking for is I'm looking for x hat. So that would be, um, ah. It's transpose a dot a or times a, and then we need the inverse of all of that. And then that's times the transpose of a times b. So there we go. X hat is gonna be negative three and Five, which means alt seven, I'm going to interpret it. This means that M equals negative three and B equals five. Um, notice that I keep putting spaces in between. I feel like it's just a little bit more easy to read if I do B space equals space. I don't know, just, it's easier on my eyeballs. Um, it's just the style preference. Okay. But what did A ask for? Am I down to that? Let's see the line that best fits this data. So that means the line that best fits the data is y equals negative 3x plus b. Like that. So now I have finished part A. Or I'm going to just add in a label right here. Interpreting, no, alt six. Interpreting the least squares solution. There we go. So I break, the, I break this down slowly. Like I specifically ask for you to, um, find the systems of equations in a different part than I ask you to like solve the matrix to try and help walk you through it a little bit. But remember, I do need you to do like part A and then put your work under part A and then now we're on to part B and so I would expect you to do part B, which I think I'm using the header alt five. Part B, yes. Okay, so part B says, what is the least squares error? So the least squares error, that was just the distance between B and A times X hat, where A times X hat is B parallel. And remember, norm is the command that we use to find the distance. So there we go, square root of six. And then I'll just take a moment and write it like that. 
And then what is the relative error? So now we're into part C. Let's label it part C. And I'm just going to put some space. I like space. I like delineation. So relative error is equal to, I'm going to say norm B minus A dot X hat all over norm of B. And then I use that N command to make a number, a decimal number show up instead. Because, I mean, if I didn't, it would be one over root six, which I'm like, yeah, I know that's less than one, which it better be, because that's as big as it can get. I don't know what that means, though. So I'm interested only in the decimal. So this was a better, um, a better answer. Is it point zero? That is around. No, go around to point one. There we go. Okay. Then, so that is our relative error. So we had like about, it was like 41% good. Um, still not a <laughs> great solution, but I promise the um, example that I give you is actually pretty good. Okay. And then part D. It says make a pretty plot in Mathematica with the data points and best fit line. So I want to see the data points and I want to see the best fit line in the same one. But we're not going to worry about making them the same one yet. We're just going to be like, let's get one of those things done. So in order to plot data, you're going to use the list plot command. Um, Let's see, I think you do it this way. So this is just a list of the data and that may be all we need. Yes, okay, you can, it's really hard to see, but there is a dot here at six zero or zero six and here. And so, you know what? Let's explore some options. Let's make this look, oops, prettier. Um, I'm pretty sure I googled like list plot dot size Mathematica when I went looking for this earlier, but I found out that if I do um, <laughs> plot markers and then you want to do automatic so at first i thought based off the documentation i was just like oh just do that um here let's zoom in please make big and so you can kind of see here that it's replaced my markers with the number three so that's not what i wanted i wanted to make it like size three or something so so then I was like, okay, so we need to do, I needed to keep the automatic and then do three. And what did that do? That made my dots really tiny. Let's try 12. Ah, those are big dots. I like those dots. I can see them. Seeing things is a good thing. And then let's also do um, like axis label. label and then remember we want to use quotation marks so that it knows that I'm using text and so that looks good um, and then let's give it a label because all pretty pictures have labels once again we're using the quotation marks best fit example that okay and then that's pretty good for our data 
Now let's make a second plot with our line. So remember that's plot and then um, the equation of our line was y equals negative 3 times x plus 5. And remember um, the little star character right here is how you do times in Mathematica. I'm pretty sure you can just use a space or leave things next to each other, but I don't feel convinced until I've put in a star. And then we have to put in the plot range if we want it to make a picture. So I'm going to say 0 to 2 because that's what the range was for the list plot was 0 to 2. And then before the 0 to 2, remember you have to cite your variable that you're using. And that has to be consistent with the variable in the problem. Do I even need the y? In fact, I'm pretty sure that if I put the y in, it'll break it. So let's get rid of that. Okay, so that's good. Now I have two plots, but I wanted them. I said make one pretty plot with theta and the um, best fit line. So if we do show and we say plot one, plot two, like that. There we go. And it's pr okay. We can do some things to make it different or look pretty. -er. For instance, I'm going to do plot style for my list plot. I'm going to make my data points red. There we go. See, and I think that looks a little bit better. And I personally find the blue, the automatic blue, is just really dull. And so there we go. Now it's a nice big bright blue. Um, what else do I want to do? Um, no, thank you, baby. Let's do aspect ratio. There we go. No, that didn't do it. Okay, so that actually brings up an interesting thing. It ad the show command adopts everything from the very first plot that you do. So if I put aspect ratio in my plot one instead of my plot two, look at that. Now I've got, I don't know, I still, I think it looks prettier. It's like tall instead of wide, which makes sense because it goes all the way up to six, but only out to two this way. Okay, so again, like I put my axis labels here under plot one, but I did not do it for plot two because when I use show, it kind of adopts everything from plot one. And again, if I were to take that and say, oh, let's put that here under um, plot two, notice my axis labels go away. So you can get away with just putting everything down once if you want. And then I think this is pretty good. Um, my only last comment about this is um, as far as making things that are pretty for me to grade, I'm going to give you like a real life scenario. Like if I were to have you, I forgot what I did already. <laughs> but if I had you do like plotting distance versus how long someone's been driving, don't call this the x-axis, you would say that the x-axis is like time and then you can put this units in parentheses like that. So that would be like time and seconds and then the y-axis would be distance in probably miles. Like that. See, and that's so much, so much better. And then you would want to have an informative plot label like, um, rate of travel or maybe finding velocity something like that something relevant to the problem that i gave you in order to make a um pretty plot that's what i would call a pretty plot okay and then very last piece um i'm downloading all of your stuff and 
going in it makes you go in through multiple folder layers in order to compile your homework so i'm gonna have you guys save everything as pdfs so like uh lectures we're gonna save this as the lecture 6.5 notebook and i'm going to save it as a pdf by just using the drop down menu right there there you go so save you want to make sure that you have compiled all of your code before you do that because here i'm going to show you what it looks like um so many subfolders if you compile it then look see i can see the input and then i can see all the outputs that went with it and then so like if we get down here to prop example four where it was like the problem eh, kind of split the system of equations up over two pages but whatever um but here you go least squares here was my input here is the output which i can only see because i compiled it and then here i go here's interpreting the solution and that's all the text and so it looks pretty um it's a pdf and so as soon as you save it like this you can upload it straight to grade scope and everything will be fine um i think that's it i think i'm done now um we have now used linear algebra in order to interpret real life problems like how does excel work this is how excel works this is what it's doing behind the curtain now you don't need excel but anyway um i'll see you guys all soon bye for now